So we do have this mad plan to build a little saffron harvesting robot so that we can make saffron and, well, probably put it in our curries. The last episode of the road trip. This one was the goal of the entire trip. Getting to talk to Adrian Boyer, who's the initiator of the RepRap project, you know, the first accessible self-replicating 3D printers. And that arguably started the entire 3D printing revolution that we're seeing today. So let's actually see where that idea of having an open source, self-replicating, self-printing robot manufacturing machine came from and what he's doing today. Now that 3D printing is all grown up and kind of self-sustaining. My name's Adrian Bowyer. I used to be a university academic uh, at Bath University. Uh, now I'm retired, except I have my own company. And at the university and in the company, I worked for the last 10 years or so on 3D printing. My background went all over the place, really. Um, as a student, I did a degree in mechanical engineering, and then I did a PhD on the interface between three areas, mechanical engineering, physics and computing. My PhD was actually on brake squeal and friction vibration, violins playing, that sort of thing. So uh, at the end of my career, I was a senior lecturer and I'd worked in lots of fields. I'd done some work in archaeology, some work in biology, and some work in biochemistry, and of course work in engineering and mathematics all over. So uh, I do a lot of things. Not all of them all that well. <laughs> yeah, I think it's because I get easily bored. <laughs> so that really lays out a ton of things that one could get into. So why specifically 3D printing? There are really two aspects to it. Um, the first was not anything to do with 3D printing. It was to do with the idea of a self-replicating machine. Um, now, I've been interested in self-replication as uh, something to do in engineering as opposed to something to do in biology um, ever since I was a child. I can't put an origin on that because it goes back as far as I can remember. As far as RepRap is concerned, what happened was in 2000, the British government gave my university a, a large equipment grant and I bought two 3D printing machines, expensive ones, because you couldn't get cheap ones then. Uh, one of them cost about um, a third of a million dollars and the other one cost about $50,000. And that's as cheap as you could go back in 2000, 2001, about when it was. But as soon as we got these machines, I realized that for the first time, we had a technology that stood a chance and we were able to copy itself because it's such a versatile manufacturing technology. I thought, basically, this can make a lot of the bits for making another one of itself. And of course, that tied in with my interest in self-replication. So I had a, I want to make a self-replicating machine. Here's a machine that stands a chance of doing it. Now, lots of people have made self-replicating machines before. For example, things like Lego brick robots that assemble another robot out of Lego bricks. So I certainly wasn't the first person to think of self-replicating machines. Indeed, the idea of that goes right back to René Descartes. Um, but um, RepRap was intended to be a useful self-replicating machine that would manufacture parts for itself and also manufacture other useful goods. As soon as I had the idea of a self-replicating manufacturing machine, uh, I suddenly realized that there were all sorts of consequences that stem from this. Um, one is the fact that uh, the price should drop very rapidly. Um, as I say, the machines that were available at the time when I started the project cost 50,000 or so. Um, and I could see, looking at what was going on inside them, that there wasn't that much money involved in making one. <laughs> and so uh, I realised that once you make something self-replicating, then really uh, you can get the price right down to the cost of the materials plus the cost of the labour uh, required to put it together. And you can minimise the latter by making it as more self most self making it as self-replicating as possible. So the, the cost thing came from that. And also I realized that if you have a self-replicating manufacturing machine, it's potentially a very powerful technology. And, and I started off with a sort of very high principled 
idea, which sounds a bit pompous really, probably it was, which was, oh, this is something which is, if it's restricted to a few people, um, might really lead to an extraordinary growth in inequality because those few people who be able to make a lot of money out of it. Now, all right, I'd be one, great, a lot of money. But nonetheless, there'd be a lot of people who'd be left out, as there always are with the introduction of uh, legally restricted technologies, like, for example, anything that's patented. Um, so I said, right, well, the way to get around that is to open source it. And so anybody can make one. And then as soon as I'd had that idea almost, I mean, literally minutes after, I said, well, hang on, that doesn't matter at all. If you've got a self-replicating technology, you can't patent it because you're saying to everyone, here's my idea. If you use my idea, then for the one thing it was intended to do, you're breaking the law, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to make a machine that copies itself, you sort of got to give it away. So that's why I decided to open source it. And of course, the open sourcing of it was something that led to lots of volunteers coming along, just as they do for open source software, and contributing ideas to it. Um, so uh, that was that was a really cool byproduct, which I hadn't fully expected. Uh, I, the open sourcing was driven by the logic, but it turned out to be socially and politically actually a very advantageous thing for the project from the point of view of input from talented people uh, who volunteered to help. When I had the idea, I thought, as I say, I thought this might be quite a powerful idea uh, for nothing to do with um, anything to do with the fact that it was my idea, merely by the logic of something that copies itself. It, it's got to be able to spread exponentially. Um, and so Given that it's a powerful idea, I thought, as it's an academic research project, which of course is how it started, one of two things will happen to it. It'll sink without a trace and nobody will ever hear of it. Or if it does go somewhere, it will really take off. I didn't think there was going to be anything between those two extremes. Um, just as a, a, a living organism will either grow in numbers exponentially or become extinct. Um, well, there are restrictions to that by, because of resources, but that's essentially the way life works. Um, and I thought exactly the same thing would happen here. So it was sort of 50-50. Will it expand and spread? And historically, that's what actually turned out to happen. But to be honest, I wouldn't have been surprised if everybody had said, oh, that's an interesting idea, and it, it never went anywhere. Well, I, I should indicate something that was actually very helpful in getting all those volunteers that I mentioned on board, uh, which was that Given that it seemed like a powerful idea to me, I thought I had a certain duty to tell people about it before I started, um, just to get input from the, the world, as it were. So I set my university's press department on it, and they put out a press release. And as a result of that, I got a lot of emails, of course, from people who said, oh, this is an interesting idea, can I help? Now, it has to be said that not every last one of those emails was from a human being who was 100% sane. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because it sounds like a sort of crazy idea, a self-replicating free manufacturing machine. Um, and But a lot of them were from people who really knew their stuff uh, from an engineering and software standpoint, an electronic standpoint, and said, yeah, can we help? And so uh, I said, yes, of course you can. And so we set up electronic means of communication and a means of sharing files and so on. Um, this was in the days before things like GitHub and, and, and so on. So that wasn't really uh, available, but we, we set it all up. Initially it was on the, my university server and then we set up our own website for the whole thing. So all those volunteers came in and they all had different ideas. And my primary desire in being the person who was supposed to be running the project was not to run it. In other words, I didn't want to tell people how I wanted it to go. So if somebody said, I want to make this sort of hot end, and somebody else said, oh no, that's rubbish, I want to make one like this, I said, well, look, both of you go and do it, and we'll see which one works best. Um, and that was always the answer. If you've got a different idea, implement it, and we'll let, let natural selection choose the best answer. Um, and so I tried, I, I took an active path of not controlling anybody or, or, or the only thing really I had to do was to, was to referee the occasional dispute when as online conversations can, they get, get a bit out, heated and out of hand. Uh, I just had to calm things down from time to time. But I let everybody who was volunteering go in their own direction. Um, 
Having said that, I was also working on it and I had a research student, a guy, a really talented guy called Ed Sells, who's now Dr. Ed Sells because of the work he did on RepRap, he did it for his PhD. Um, and uh, he and I, uh, he mainly did the mechanical design, I did a lot of the electronics uh, with some of the other volunteers, people like um, uh, Vic Oliver, for example, um, Simon McAuliffe um, and Zach Smith and so on, that, putting stuff in on the electronic side and the software side. Um, and that's how the first one came together. Um, so other people were taking other bits of it in, the, in, opposite, in different directions almost from the start, but we did end up with the first machine. And eventually there was also RepRap Limited and RepRap Pro to get more RepRap printers out into the world. Sally and my wife and I founded RepRap Limited, which is a little company that we founded just to do 3D printing using the machines. Um, and that ran for a few years. And then Jean-Marc approached us and said he had uh, a, a design for a, a little RepRap printer based on Ed Sell's Huxley design, a uh, small machine about so big. Um, and he wanted to put that out on the market and would we help by printing the parts for it? And so we did, and that was quite a success. So he then suggested we get together and form a company, and that's how we formed RepRap Pro um, uh, to make and sell more Huxleys initially. Uh, and uh, we then expanded the range of machines we had, employed more people, we got a contract to supply it to various retailers, and so on. So that's how that got started. In some ways, we were a bit late to the game that I started. I'd, I'd blown the whistle to start the game and then I sat back and watched it go and there were quite a few companies that got established on the basis of RepRap. People like Ultimata, Ultimaker, sorry I should say, and um, and initially MakerBot, though they, they went off in their own direction. Um, and so um, uh, those companies seemed to be doing reasonably well and there was a general sort of feeling that grew up really over quite a few years saying, well, why don't we do this? <laughs> and so that's what Rep Rep Pro was. And, and we, we were quite successful, but, and, and it worked for uh, four or five years. Uh, but then we discovered towards the end that so much competition had been engendered, something which I had originally anticipated because of this thing I mentioned about the price of the machines falling because they self-reproduce that we found that it didn't make much economic sense to be selling rep rat kits uh, to try and make a lot of money. So we, we, we made a profit, we never made a loss, uh, but in the end we decided to, to close the company down. Um, well, we didn't quite close it, we, we sold it to a Chinese company who wanted some of the technical expertise that we built up. But um, So uh, it, it rose and it fell, uh, and we're still working as consultants in the area as Rep, Rep Limited. We either develop things for our own interest, we've got a number of projects going on, um, this is one. Um, this is a little, little robot, um, which as you can see is 3D printed. Um, which we're developing uh, with a view possibly to selling it into schools because it uses the same kind of sensor in miniature that self-driving cars use to sense their surroundings. It's basically a LiDAR. Um, and so we thought that it would be interesting for schools to experiment with the kind of software that um, controls self-driving cars without the slight danger of school pupils running each over with a real car. Um, whoops, and the wheels drop off at the moment because it's not fully assembled. Um, that sort of product we just developed because it, this seems like an interesting thing to do. But also people approach us, uh, they want 3D prints run, which we do, and we post them out to them and charge them for that. And people uh, want us to design devices, design electronics, write software and so on. And we take on some of those jobs, but we are in the fortunate position that we can be reasonably selective about what we choose to do and what we don't. So we don't have to keep chasing clients all the time in order to succeed, fortunately. We can, we can treat it as more than a hobby, but less than a lifeline, if you see what I mean, uh, which is a very comfortable thing to do. And uh, when we're not working in the company, we're growing plants and looking after animals and going for walks, going, going around the place, looking at things, examining old architecture. My wife and I spend a lot of time going to places and admiring 
admiring ancient churches and so on. So, you know, the, the sorts of things that retired people do, in my case. Um, we decided to build our own heating control system, uh, Wi-Fi based, all 3D printed of course, the, not all 3D printed, the, the boxes for everything are 3D printed, so we can print this, which is the base of the device which controls the radiators and the boilers and so on, and then we just buy an ordinary power adapter that fits in there, and then we've got a PCB which controls the boilers and the radiators based on the ESP8266. Uh, Wi-Fi module, we can uh, turn the heating on and off and control the temperatures from anywhere we want to. Uh, the finished device you can see on the wall over there, that's the finished device. You may have just seen its LED flash, that means it was uh, polling the um, server to see whether it should be on or off, and because it's still dark it should be off. Um, and uh, it's connected to the little valve underneath and the projecting square bit at the bottom is actually what the temperature sensor is mounted on. If you go to the RepRap Limited GitHub repository uh, you'll find all the designs for the um, printed parts, the PCB designs and all the software uh, all, all on there. Extensive documentation's not the word um, because we did it for the house ourselves so um, we know how it works. So those are the kind of things you can freely spend some time on once your other projects like Rep have graduated out into the world and now have a life of their own. But was RepRap a success? When I started it, I thought it will be nice if this succeeds. Who doesn't start a project thinking it will be nice if my project succeeds? Of course, that as something that I would like came to pass. So that, that's pleasing and I, I, it can of course be considered a goal and, and it was a goal that I've seen. But as far I, I my life goal is not to have life goals. Um, I, uh, as I mentioned, I used to be a university academic and of course one of the things that that involves is, is interviewing uh, young people who are about to leave school and go to university um, about what they want to do and uh, how they see themselves fitting in, in my case, to an engineering degree. Um, and I was, a, was always a little bit worried when somebody came for an interview and said that they saw themselves by the age of 35, I would like to be a senior manager in such and such a company. And, and they seemed to have their whole life mapped out from the point of taking up tertiary education to the, their own point of retirement. And it seemed to me that that was a very fragile thing to do. Um, and I certainly have tried not to do it for myself. Whenever opportunities come along, I examine them and decide whether or not to take them. But, and sometimes I pursue things, such as the Red Red Project, but um, that tends to be as a result of either having the idea or finding out about something in the world which I decide to go for. I don't have a, I don't have a charted course. Yeah, that's, that's nice. So. I hope you enjoyed this little look behind the scenes of why we have these awesome little, well, originally self-replicating 3D printers. I'm working on a more detailed documentary style version of this story as well, but I have no idea when that's actually going to be ready for release. Shout out to my patrons who are making this entire thing possible. There's Ronnie Lowe, Paul Arden, Andrea Madro, Phyllis Studer, and James Koch in the shouter tier, and you can join in as well for regular Q&A hangouts and more. This was the last video from the road trip. I will need to re-upload the E3D factory tour video because that has some issues with the YouTube processing for whatever reason. But the next video on the channel will be back to regular content. So stay tuned, get subscribed, and I will see you then. You see, I have... I had parents who told me to sit up straight. I now have a child who tells me to sit up straight. So here I'm stuck in the middle.